Um, hello, everyone. It's great to have you here this evening um, because the man we're talking to has been a massive inspiration for mountain bikers over the years. So, hi, Martin. Great to see you. Um, How's it going? That's good, mate. It's good. <laughs> yeah, all more fun talking to you. Um, and it's great that the people are out there. Don't forget, if you've got really good questions for Martin uh, and you think I'm asking crap questions, fine. <laughs> Sling them in, <laughs> um, and I'll put them out there. But uh, Martin, it, I think the first thing we want to know is: it, I know you started out on trials motorbikes, didn't you? So, yeah. What was, what was the first bike that you got put on? Was it a motorbike or a push bike? And who put you on it? Um, well, I'm I'm the youngest of three brothers, so I used to have like the hand-me-down bikes to start with, tiny little push bikes. But you're talking like you know little 16 inch wheel things um and then i the first motorbike i went on to if anyone's out there who knows what trials is i'd had i had a ty80 which is the standard first motorcycle trials bike any kid has um yeah and just got into the just followed my brothers into motorcycle trials so that's how i got started in i guess bike sports of some kind you know that's that's where it all kicked off um, I, and I've always and I've always loved it ever since. Well, what lured you into the mountain bike world and got you off that motorcycle? Um, you know, it's weird actually because back in it would have. I'm just trying to get my years right because I'm rubbish with years. It would probably would have been about 1992 or 1993. I went to a mountain bike event. I'd been riding motorbike trials for a long time at that point. And I was probably at, you know, the bit where I was doing all right at it. Um, but motorcycle trials, a bit more glamorous these days. But back then it was all like flat caps and, you know, it, it was a bit like old school, a, a bit, especially in the UK, because all the sort of top riders were from Yorkshire and it was all, you know, the Lampkins. And yeah, it was, a bit, it, was it wasn't like super trendy. Um, and we went to a, we went to a, me and my friend went to a mountain bike event just because it was near us and we had nothing to do on a Saturday. And I just couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it, it was a place called Caesar's Camp. So it was like in near Farnborough and it was a big uh, national race. I'm not sure what the, the um, it wasn't Norber, it was something else. I can't remember what the cat, the, the organizing body was, but it was like the British, British Championship Series, I guess. And there was people like Nick Craig there and David Baker. And we was just watching all these awesome cross country guys going round and round and round for what seemed like hours. And I just thought, guys, it just felt so young, you know, it just felt so like cool, you know? And I just, I was like mad into it from then on really. But only in a sense, I just loved watching it. I wasn't really racing cross country or anything like that. I was still riding trials, but couldn't, I, I just loved all the magazines and all that shit, you know, just like, sorry, I swear, I'm terrible, sorry, anyone out there doesn't want to hear swear words. We'll bleep that out, we'll bleep that out and edit it, don't worry. <laughs> A bit late. <laughs> but so, you were inspired by cross country, That that's kind of weird. <laughs> well, yeah, but back then, like, cross country was it, wasn't it? All the cross country riders were the superstars, like, um... Caroline Alexander and oh you know there was such they were Tim Gould really uh, cool and that's who the magazines were focusing on so I was just I was just into those I just thought they were all rad you know just looked cool even Steve P started um, cross country so yeah yeah but um yeah he was actually I remember watching him racing as well across country um, yeah yeah way back in the day I was a bit more into it at that point and it was he was riding a cross country race on his Kona <laughs> <laughs> so it was quite a long time ago. But so I got that, that event, I there happened to be a trials event at it as well oh, in the evening as a bit of a a bit of a like sideshow, which is what trials has always been at mountain bike events, really a bit of a like, oh let's go and watch the trials guys do some stunts sort of thing. Um and yeah, I, I borrowed someone's bike and rode in that contest. I just sort of thought like there was someone there and I was like, I looked at the sections they'd made and I was like, they they can't be serious, that can't be the sections. <laughs> and because I was riding 20 inch trials at the time. So the level was quite a lot higher in that sport. And yeah, it just sort of cleaned up at that event because it was, there was, the level wasn't super high. And and it was just good timing, I guess, a bit of luck. Yeah. And, and was there anyone particular that was your inspiration at that time? 
Um, well, in motorcycle trials, it was a guy called Jordi Torres, who was a, he's a Spanish trials rider who I just was devoted to. He was my god. I just loved him. Um, and in mountain biking, I think it was probably it was probably someone like Tomac or someone like that. I was just mad, but only just because everyone else thought they you know the ride those riders were super cool. I tell you what I really liked was um, I ended up being a teammate of hers in the end, Alison Seidel. Just thought she was the coolest sort of female racer. She was really cool. But yeah, I mean, in, in trials for push bikes, there's a guy in Spain called Op P. And I don't know if anyone out who's listening will have heard of Op P, but he's this mad wizard trials bike rider who's pretty cool. I used to be into him a lot. And in the UK, I guess I, I really loved Hans Ray. Everyone loved Hans Ray, Hans Ray, don't they? He's just cool. Mad cool himself. So uh, pretty rapidly you got into it. Um, and you know, British champ, world champ. But who then started to come up alongside you um, and be a challenge to you? That's bloody Chris Ackrick, wasn't it? <laughs> bloody Chris Ackrick. Was he a nice guy? Yeah, he's a great, he's one of my best <laughs> friends. But we had we had a great relationship in bike trials because we were we were competing against each other on the mountain bikes, but also mostly on the sort of trials bike scene, not necessarily the mountain bike scene, but um we were sort of we would be first and second in the British Championship. Um I think I won like two or two of them and then took a break and Chris started winning. And then I come back and managed to beat him again. And I took a bit of a break, basically, because I was terrified of him. And uh, then I, I had a couple of years off and come back uh, and I managed to nab one off him again. So he would, I always joke that if I turned up, he'd never won any of them. But truth was, <laughs> truth was, he was, he was just mad good. And I got lucky with my timing, I think, <laughs> where I went in. So, but I think he's won the British Championship like six times. I've won it like four times, I think, but four Four times British champion, but he's won it like six or maybe seven. But he he was the guy I was always up against. I tell you what, anyone who knows him, if he is not someone you want to be up against, he's <laughs> fierce. <laughs> but still good, but still good mates. Yeah, in the competition side, we had a really like, you know, he's quite uh, intimidating. Charles is quite combative. You know, it's very in your face. People don't really, unless you go to a trials event, you don't really get that sense of it. But you're stood right next to the person you're trying to beat and you're both looking at what you're about to do and one of you has to go first and when one of you goes first you've either got to put the pressure on or or go second and handle that pressure and it just goes to and throw through the day um so in the, the events themselves me and me and Chris used to have quite the psychological battle but um but out off the bikes we're yeah yeah, great, yeah. great mates. Yeah, he's well, one, I remember, one of the nicest people I know. I love him. Yeah, and I, I mean, I do remember when uh, you had the bucket bike, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and Chris was one of the guys pushing you that, and all him and that no, was different. They, everyone was pushing me. Chris was throwing me. <laughs> <laughs> he was pushing me off the cliff. And, and they were just laughing like trains, weren't they? They were just having so yeah, much. It was fun a great. It on. was a great day, man. That was. It was all fun that day. It was nerve wracking at the very first bit of it but not you know it was just a joyous day we all had to we planned it and just felt incredible yeah, it was, yeah. we were buzzing well i'm going to jump forward a bit from the trials days what was mm. the inspiration for road bike party uh danny mccaskill danny mccaskill was my i i was um probably i don't know how old i'd been when i did road bike party but in my sort of i was in my 30s and I was like a sort of gig in trials show rider, you know, I was like my, my, my professional riding had turned into doing shows, which I loved. Um, I wasn't doing competitions that much. I was just doing shows and magazine articles. And Danny came on the scene with his, his sort of video that sort of broke him out to everybody. And suddenly he was that kid on YouTube. Um, and he just nailed that video. He just, oh, you can go back and watch it now. It's still fantastic. And I would urge anyone to do that if they're bored, you know, with me talking or later in the evening, <laughs> um, go and watch it. It's, I can't remember, it's got a, such a crap title. 
it hasn't got a very memorable title. I think it's called Inspired Bicycles, Danny McCaskill, something like that. But it's basically, if you can find it, I think it's 2008 it came out. But he just nailed the formula for a YouTube video. He he got the the intro really builds slowly, but you can see, you get an idea of his personality. He's a pretty chilled kid. He's not, doesn't seem, you know, sh too showy. And then you just grow to like him through the video and the pace builds and builds and builds. And it just, there's more moments and moments where you're like, no way, no way, no. You know, it just gets more and more. And I just thought, God, how can I do that? And, you know, I, I, well, it wasn't how could I do that? It was like, well, if I want to stay relevant, I need to do something like that. Like you must do a video because that's what everyone's doing. And previously for me, videos have been on VHS. So I was <laughs> behind the times. So my video career had been, yeah, definitely VHS and straight to DVD type style. So I, I was like, I need to do something on YouTube that's going to, my sponsors are going to like and and I just couldn't think of a, a, a you know anything that was going to sort of outdo what Danny was doing because he was such his riding level was so great so I just thought well what can I do with what can I do with my riding skills and it still be super fun and smashing a road bike to be it seemed like really good fun but the blooming thing didn't break <laughs> it just kept going so we didn't have to keep trying harder and harder things you must have been worried that that bike was just going to Disintegrate. Nah, I really, I actually really wasn't. No, I was only kidding. I, oh. I, no, I'd never thought for a moment it would break. They're so oh. strong. A road bike, if you land straight, you know, I mean, a wheel, you know, it's integrity. If you land absolutely straight, it's bloody strong. You know what I mean? It's, if you land off axis, then you're going to have issues with it. But I wasn't planning on landing off axis at any point. So I just, I just kept it really simple and then if you keep it simple and land straight all the time and just don't don't push the wheels in that way they're not they're not going to go anywhere you get the odd puncture maybe but we didn't even have you know, famously on Ray, road bike park we only had one so we had one puncture that was it <laughs> it was exactly. that was actually because the next time we did a road bike party we had about four or five so we were a bit lucky but what did you you pushed on in in second one didn't you YouTube. Well, the second one, my idea was, well, it was popular. And I said I was going to do a second one to some of my friends. And they were like, oh, it's done. You don't need to do that anymore. You're going to become like the road bike guy if you do that. And I, I don't, but I knew, I just knew there was more I could do. So I just thought I'll do everything that I've ever done on a bike. I'll get it all in on one video and that'll be me done. I'll just be like, that's what I can do. I'll land every single thing I can do. Um, and I, but I'll do it on a road bike, you know, I did not because, you know, in theory, it's all the same. It's not, it's not, um, you know, a bike's a bike. Mm, as far I'm as... having trouble hearing you. <laughs> Siri's chiming in. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I, so I just, I just went for it. I was just like, well, I'm just going to do every single thing I can. Um, but obviously got, had a bit of an interruption. So I got someone else to do it. <laughs> yeah, I, I just going to, yeah, there was the interruption and then, um, mm. I just wondered, did you feel really sort of competitive with the stuff that Danny and Chris were doing? Uh, yeah, oh, a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> well, I mean, with Chris, I knew Chris would do stuff that I wouldn't do because our riding styles are not similar at all. So I knew if we if I gave Chris the bike and I, I sort of tricked him into it, um, I knew he'd do something Chris-like, and in the video he does. He, he goes and does really weird off-road stuff that's really technical. That even, you know what I mean? It's like, you can't, I was sort of frustrated because it's so difficult. You can't really tell on video how hard it is. Like only, it was almost like only I know how hard it was. And I wanted something that was great for an audience. But, you know, he just, he just if, you, if anyone ever could walk the line he does on that road bike, you were, if you were stood there, you wouldn't believe it. It's the, the technical ability is just mad. Um, so I knew he'd do something like that, but Danny kind of, I had, to, I had to give, I had to prescribe the tricks because they were the things that I'd planned to do. Oh, right. So I was a bit, I was a bit gutted with the loop at Manchester because I found that first and I wanted, I'd actually trained to do it um, and I didn't get to do it, but he did it you know he did it like third go or something crazy 
Um, but then he did do his like, I don't know if anyone remembers Robot Party 2 big bits from that, but he rolls down this hill in the lakes, like down this hill backwards on his front wheel. And I wasn't jealous about that because well, I was jealous, but I wasn't annoyed because I would never have been able to do that. So there was one bit he put in that I was like, wow, I couldn't. I couldn't have done that anyway. So it was, it was pretty rare. They're amazing. They were both amazing. I basically put them on the spot at a very, very difficult moment. And and they both just sort of come through. And it was incredible. It was, it was an amazing experience to, I mean, it was a lot of pressure. That they, you know, it's, it's no joke when you've got a camera on you and you're trying to land a trick on a, on a bike that's worth, I don't know, at the time, it's probably worth, Ten thousand pound plus, I don't know, but it, not so much the value of the bike. That's not really the pressure. It was more like the pressure of the situation, of, uh, you know. Because you, when you're trying to do a video, you're you're desperately trying to walk along the line of um, nailing something that's so dangerous or difficult that you're probably going to, if you don't nail it, you're going to break you, which adds an amazing amount of time to the production of the video, and it starts to derail really quickly. If you get injured, the the energy goes. The you know your cameraman gets booked for something else. It it falls apart so easy. It's really hard to do. You see these videos like what Danny. I, I tell you what, I've seen a clip. Oh my god, I can't tell you. Can't tell you guys online. I've seen a clip that's not out yet, and it it of a video that's coming. It's crazy. <laughs> I got I saw a secret shot the other day. But I'm not even going to say it was, but I've already, <laughs> I've already talked about him, so you probably know who I mean. But there's a, you, when there's someone's on a video pr production of the like level of like, of Danny Mac or someone like that, and they're, they've got big sponsors behind it, it's difficult. It's really difficult to do because the pressure is severe. Well, I think we've, we've got to move on to what meant that those guys had to do Road by Bard 2 for you. Um, where did your almost immediate positivity come from post-accident? Was it purely a character trait? Was it just you, mate? Or was it partly due to the sport and that just the, the buzz that we get and the sense of community that we've got as well? <laughs> I don't know. I'm not sure I was immediately positive. <laughs> I'm not sure I was. I, I mean, I had... I, so I, I had this accident on this show and um, I basically sort of just plummeted down off my bike onto my sort of shoulders here and just like basically snapped myself in half that, and that's how I broke my back and it left me paralyzed from like kind of belly button level down so I've got no feeling or sensation below that area at all and I just knew immediately what had happened. So that's the weird bit about the, the actual immediate thing is that the moment I kind of crumpled and come back up, as I come back up, I, I knew straight away, like, all right. And I, so I, it was sort of an immediate process. It's a very strange situation to try and describe because obviously it's not like something you, you want anyone else to experience really, but it's a very strange situation. And it's weird, your body's so heavy, like you, you, you don't realize how, body, how, how heavy your body is when you don't have that control over the limbs. So you feel almost like cemented to the spot, you know, like it's really strange. Like, so like my, all my legs were suddenly really heavy and I couldn't, you, you can't sort of, cause at that point as well, you're not used to being able to move your body weight around like I can now. So I just felt like cemented to the spot and it was really strange. Suddenly gravity is a very apparent force. You're like stuck to the floor, you know, because you haven't got your sort of muscle spring sort of lift lightning you. And yeah, I just sort of, I tried to process it, as, process it as well as I could at the time. And then I was like helicoptered away and that was, pretty, that was actually pretty cool. I've never been on helicopter before. So that's quite exciting. And I went away on the helicopter and then you start to get a bit of time to like really process what's going on. You start to like, okay, this is real, this is happening. And it wasn't until I sort of got in the, um, well, they called them tubes, you know, you go in and they scan you. Um, I've forgotten what they're called. 
oh, like an MRI scan. You know, I went in one of those and suddenly had a moment just to myself and there was just like this whirring sound of this thing going round and round me like a big magnet or whatever it is that MRIs you. I don't really know how they work, obviously. Um, and I, I kind of just thought, right, okay. Like just once I'd had a moment to think about it, I just thought, right, oh, well, let's just go for this then. <laughs> don't really have much choice <laughs> you don't really have it's very it's very matter of fact to be honest it's just like well let's just just go for it just do what we do what we can with this and you know I, I try daily you know you just have to try daily it's I'm you know, I'm not gonna lie it's not easy for sure. I'd, lo I'd love to tell you it's all great fun yeah. <laughs> it's really not it's really hard and um me and my wife have been talking today about how difficult it is as, as time goes by actually you, it, it changes you know it, it sort of catches up with you at times but yeah you know I, I just wanted to I feel like I had a lot of really great people around me so I felt like well okay whatever I can dream up I could probably try well that was going to be uh, people around be, me that was going to be one of my questions Martin how did your mates react how, you know how did they um, how did they sort of help you out in a way um, well, they're all different, you know. Every, I mean, all that, maybe. <laughs> Rob, oh my god! <laughs> oh, you know what? Rob was really funny. He was really funny because um, he didn't want to talk to me. He was away at the time. Actually, all of the like, all my sort of downhill friends were away. At, I don't know what event it would have been, but they were at a World Cup somewhere. Um, not not in the UK. So my only contact with them was basically while I was in the intensive care bit I would get a phone call now and again from people just having they'd heard the news kind of thing because it was getting out like I don't know through you know rumor or social media or something like that um and Rob Rob rang me and he was like oh Mark I'm sorry I've been putting it off I couldn't ring you and I was like oh it's all right mate I understand you know like he went oh mate you got some fucking dark days Ed <laughs> I was like, he's so honest. I mean, I don't know if anyone out there knows who's listening knows Rob. He's the most amazing person. He's like no one else you'll ever meet. Honestly, to honest to God, there's no one like him. And he's just, um, oh, he's, he's just amazing. And that's what he's like. He's just absolutely honest. He just says stuff that comes to his head and he just says it out loud. And sometimes it's really funny and sometimes it's really awkward and sometimes it's really... Um, inappropriate or disrespectful <laughs> he's amazing he's absolutely amazing how that guy manages to do a live television broadcast and get away with it is a is a, is a feat of brilliance in itself because he is he is seriously filtering some wild thoughts <laughs> so you must have really enjoyed when you had him on the back of the uh, random tandem oh it's flipping out that's the best yeah it's great because he had him <laughs> You yeah. had him absolutely wetting himself in fear, and you were giggling yeah. the whole time. Yeah, well, on the front of that bike, everything feels fine because it just feels like a bike. It just it just feels like a really crap bike because it's terrible at going around corners. It's just awful. <laughs> it's weird because you go into a corner, and instead of like going into the corner like that, you kind of go past the corner and do this weird bus turn where you like. You know, go yeah it's really strange but that means the person at the back is almost getting cut across the, the corner tight all the time so i think that heightens their feeling i've got the corner wrong but i've got the front end right but the back end is a different matter so yeah i've not had anyone who gets on that bike and really survives it mentally they they leave you know psychologically damaged because it's just <laughs> terrifying <laughs> It really is. The only person who can kind of handle it is Blake because we've ridden it quite a lot together. Um, but I don't think he loves it. Yeah, I mean, he'll let, we have a good time on it, but it's not something we, I want to... I rode it at Whistler and I rode down um, A-line on it. And I, I think the third time I went down there, I just thought, that's it. I've had enough of this thing. I'm out. I just... Because it, it's, it's dangerous. <laughs> Someone asked me to do another video on it the other day, and I was like, oh, my God, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. 
Yeah, I mean, I think at least Rob Warner was being a bit less of the big girls' playoffs by the end of the ride down there. He was beginning yeah, to be in but the corners, wasn't it? If I yeah. was to do another video on it, I think I'd just like to do another video with Rob because <laughs> he's just so funny. He's just, he's just he's the best guy, man. He's so he's, he's such a good laugh. Well, again, I'm sort of going back to the the, the period after the injury. Um, you were determined to continue being a sportsman. Uh, you tried a few other sports. How did that go? Mm -hmm. Oh, various varying degrees of success, really. I tried. Um, there's some obvious things you can try when you're when you've had a spinal cord injury, is like like the hand biking. Um, I did a little bit of that. Um, I tried some wheelchair racing, which was uh, it was really funny, but it's not funny. It's kind of dumb, really. When you when you when I was in that hospital and I was sort of like contemplating what I would do next I remember thinking I'm embarrassed to admit but I remember thinking oh, I'll do something like I'll do like you know the Olympics type do that, like the hand biking in the Olympics or I'll do like the wheelchair rugby in the Olympics or something like that just for this like arrogance of like oh you just be able to do that until you meet the people who do that and you realize they're not they're not good for disabled people they're just really good <laughs> Like the levels the same, <laughs> they're Olympic level. You just you think like oh well the level can't be as high because there's not that many of them. But they're, they're they're like I did some wheelchair racing and I got I did a hundred meter race with a lineup of about eight people, and one of the one of the people was one of the people in that race was an uh, I think she was eleven years old, eleven year old girl on her in her pink wheelchair and she had a pink helmet to match. And before the sprint, I was like, oh, I like your helmet. That's really cool. She's like, oh, thanks. And then she, she beat me by about 20 meters. It was ridiculous. It was like, they are so strong. She was, I think she actually was in the Olympics this year, the Paralympics this year. Same girl. Um, they're just so fast and they're so strong. And you're just like, oh man, I can't do this. I need to get back to something <laughs> I'm good at. I'm, like, I'm not going to be good at something in, in disability sport. They're all too, they're all too good. So I, I <laughs> invented disability mountain biking. <laughs> I just went back to my roots. I better like get back to something I know. Yeah, no, obviously the bucket bike was the start of that. Yeah. Which basically you, you, you kind of, grabbed the idea from skiing didn't you yeah i was what i was um <laughs> it was like i was watching the sit skiing in the uh, snow what is it the winter olympics the snow olympics <laughs> i was watching the winter olympics and um yeah i was watching this sit skiing and i was something was banging on my head of like oh, that's and then I was looking at my bike, which was in the living room, because I used to have, just have my bike in the room to look at because I was so desperate to do something. And it took me about 10 minutes to connect the dots. I was like, why don't you just put one of those seats on that bike? Just roll down a hill. That's what they're doing. Like, but they're sliding. You just roll. And it was, as, it was as simple as that. I don't know why no one had ever done it before that. I really don't. It's so obvious because it's just gravity, isn't it? You just roll down the hill. And it was mega. When we did it, I couldn't, oh, it was so much fun. It's super scary because you're kind of strapped on. So you can't, you can't crash. <laughs> well, you, well, you can, but you don't want to. Yeah, it's kind of funny. And, it. and having your two mates with you. Uh, uh, yeah, well, we had, I had Chris there, Danny and Blake. And yeah, we were, the, the idea was, is that if they just, if I just rolled down the hill on my own, um, as a video it would have actually been kind of boring because i'm not going very fast um so what we thought was if we added a bit of chris atkrig and danny mccaskill and blake sampson they'd be doing some like moves around me that would kind of add a bit of energy to the scene you know so got airborne. they were basically well a little bit but they they were basically just filler <laughs> to like to like it's lighten the, the yeah lighten the scene a little bit make it a bit more action packed but that was a great video it's one of the, one of the best days I so I always think back and I always think well who would have that's how ridiculous life is isn't it is that I've had one of the best days genuinely had one of the best days on a bike in my life 
after I was paralyzed, which doesn't add up for all the things I used to do on my bike before I was paralyzed, but that's the truth, you know, that's one of the best days I've ever had on a bike. Well, it, you, I think just watching that, it, it was so inspiring because you were obviously enjoying yourself so much. So <laughs> that was the thing. But that was the first step. But the sheer ingenuity of engineers uh, must have been a major factor of, of how you've stepped on from there. So the bucket bike was first. Nice pun. Like that. Stepped on. <laughs> Get that. <Very> nice. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I'd meant that. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, <laughs> obviously you're not a big fan of the uh, random, random tandem, but your trike bike that you've got now, yeah. yeah. Oh man, I don't know if it, oh, I love that bike. No, I don't, I don't hate the random tandem. I think <laughs> it's really good fun. Um, but it, it, but there is no doubt that it isn't fun for the person on the back. It's re it's genuinely scary. It's like, so I've had a couple of people get off it and they were scared to the point where they weren't having a nice time. So it's, you've got to pick your, pick your opponent well for that bike. You know, they've got to, they've got to be really on board with the idea. Um, but it is, I think it is genuinely frightening. I've seen too many people who are, um, you know, really confident bike riders come off it with jelly legs, <laughs> terrified. So it's a, it's a strange experience, but the stuff I'm riding now, the bike I've got at the moment is called a Bowhead, which is a Canadian bike um, built by a, call, a guy called uh, Christian Bag, who's also in a wheelchair, but he's been in a chair a lot longer than I have, and he's an engineer. Um, so he's designed this bike from a wheelchair user's perspective. So it's just an incredible solution to go out and ride on the trail. You're really in command of your own day. You can get on and off it yourself. You can balance yourself on canvas out on the trail. You can stop and turn around and you just got so much more control. So the day out on a bike with your friends is much more like a normal day out on a bike. Yeah. They're not, they're not helping you as much still a bit here and there, but you know, they're, they're, they're help, you know, they're just there, there to have a good day with you. And it, and that, it, it's an amazing feeling. It's it's such a cool bike. It, it's a <laughs> getaway of murder, really, because it's actually a very powerful electric motorbike. If you think about it, don't think about it too hard mountain bikers. Don't think about it too. <laughs> um, but that's essentially what it is. It's very very powerful. Um, and if I was to really, you know, you don't want a hundred of them out on the trails, you know, because it would look like a motocross track. But people are really supportive and understand the difference you know, that it's making, but... Um, well, they don't give you grief because you're on an electric bike then? No, I don't. Everyone's really keen to see me out. I get loads of, yeah, I mean, I get loads of high fives and I get into great conversations with everyone out on the trail. I love it. I love my favourite place to go. I love going to Bike Park Wales on it and because they got the cafe and I love hanging out and chatting more than I do riding down the trails. I like just having a laugh. So, um yeah, I just, I just love going out on it. But I've got a hand bike version of it coming in a few weeks. Yeah. And I'm, I'm really excited about that because that's a proper e-bike. You know, use a Bosch motor, it's hand bikes, hand bike control, which means I'll be, you know, using my upper body for exercise rather than just nailing a throttle. And yeah, I'm super, that's going to be much more like a mountain bike experience, which I'm really looking forward to. And three wheel again, Martin. Yeah, it's the, pretty much the same bike as the bowhead I ride at the moment. It's just that it's got hand bike, is powered by hand crank. So you, it, you can't do quite as much on it because you haven't got the handlebar control. So when you, if you imagine when you're leaning the bike, the crank can still move. So you're probably not going to have quite the same accuracy on the trail. But the great thing is you'll be able to climb so I could go to Bike Park Wales and do laps rather than like do one battery getting up the climb and having a run down and then having to charge a massive battery again. You know, I'll be able to just, I'll be able to go around that place all day long, but I'll probably only make it up there once. <laughs> I'll be so tired. <laughs> I'll be like, I screw this, take me back down. Yeah. yeah. But I, I mean, it's interesting. You, we talked earlier on about how you, you steer these bikes, particularly, mm. The bowhead. Um, yeah, it's it's a weird bike. Like yeah, well, it is because you've got two front wheels, 
Um, so what you find yourself doing is as you go into a corner, the articulation on the bike works that I'm kind of strapped to the frame of the bike, basically. So the back wheel stays in line with my spine. So wherever I lean my spine, the back wheel will lean in. So you can go into a corner and lean in. So you kind of drop your hip in, that drops the back wheel over, but then you have to hold the front wheels up high. So it's not like a, a normal bike, your bars are on the outside. But what you find you start doing is letting the front wheel catch the inside of a corner, like a rally car would almost like a Scandi flick, you know, and you'll let the back end drift and it will pull the bike round tight. And it, it, you start thinking a bit more like, about the two front wheels and how they can help you and you get an amazing grip in the corners with the two front wheels because you can really let the front like drift out but with confidence it's not like if you like if you let your single front wheel drift like i do that bike you'd be a madman you'd be sam hill but you know it, it, it you can just let it go because you can just crank the front brake on if you want so it feels wild but when you drive home you've got if you're like driving home in your car you've still got a kind of rally brain on. So you kind of you have some very interesting lines on the roundabouts on the way home. <laughs> Just catching the edge of my hand controls on my car. I mean, yeah. I've seen I've seen four-wheel mountain bikes and, and disabled riders uh, mm. in, in the Alps and, and they seem much more um, prone to braking. Is the three-wheel option probably the best way to make a a, a bike. Um, well, I mean, I've never ridden a four wheel one. I've done, I don't, I don't really know. I've never ridden one. Um, I, the only one I've seen is there's a guy called Stacy Cohart who is in Whistler, who's probably, if you search online, four wheel mountain bike, he'd be the guy who comes up and he's absolutely amazing on it. Like, jumps everything. He can, like, get tabletops done on it and clears every jump on A line. He's absolutely amazing. And he's been doing it for years. You know, he's been riding there forever. So he's the only four wheel bike rider I've seen and he makes it look great. But um, the difference with the bowhead is because it's articulated, you can lean into the corners. So that doesn't sound like that big a deal, but that is riding. You know, that's the difference between riding and driving is that your body weight is really significant. And yeah, it's it, the without doubt the bowhead is. I'm not sponsored by bowhead, by the way. I'm not trying to plug some bike. I, this is not a. But without doubt, that is the the leading bike in that kind of field at the moment because it's just totally different to everything else, and it it's a riding experience that you know you can. It's very hard to recreate once you've got an injury like mine, but to be able to go out and sort of experience a mountain bike trail like that with so much confidence is remarkable, really. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Well, I've, I've got a few questions from the audience, Nazi. Oh, sick. <clears throat> I've got one here. I, I, um, do you see much of Martin Hoyes? These horse, days? mountain horse. Well, you know, I said I went to a mountain bike event with, with my friend, back in 1992 that was martin horse so me and martin rode motorbike trials together um he's a little bit older than me so he was almost he was, was sort of like ahead of me in the motorbike trials age categories only just only just but um yeah he me and him kind of grew up riding motorbike trials and we went to this first mountain bike event together because we'd already got into the like the 20 inch push bike trial scene um, and we were riding competitions in that and um, yeah and, and he was it, it was the same thing for him that day is that we both were like wow this is crazy how cool this event is and we both rode that trials event I won it he comes second it's <laughs> literally how it happened I mean it's so lucky I mean my it's, I've been so lucky in my life with some of the stuff that's happened I think most professional riders have had an incredible amount of luck somewhere. But that day I went to a mountain bike event, watched it as I was watching it, decided this is something I'd like to do. I rode an event that evening. I won it. Someone gave me a trophy and Steve Bear come up to me and said he'd like to do a photo shoot. And I was on the cover of a magazine a month later. <laughs> and that's literally how it happened. It's madness. Oh, and, I, and then I was, I remember like the magazine come out 
actually you know Horsey was on the front and I we, we were it was me and him in the magazine as like a feature um and and Horsey was on the cover and that's Martin Horse that's the guy that you know, you know, um, listeners talk, asking about and um about two days after the mag came out um Ian Weverell from Hope rang us and said oh I've seen you guys in the magazine but we knew Ian Weverell from motorcycle trials because Ian Weverell who started Hope was a, was actually still is but was actually a fantastic world-class trials rider <laughs> on motorcycles that's his background so I knew him as like this genius motorcycle trial and he rang me up and was like oh I'd like to send you some of our hubs and I was like what okay <laughs> fair enough red ones please <laughs> and I've been I've been using Hope ever since <laughs> Oh, fantastic. That, yeah. that question came from Jonathan Smith. Hello, Jonathan. <coughs> uh, next one, um, question from Alex. Any plans to try out the new Orange Phase AD3? Does that mean? <laughs> oh, yeah, I know the point. I mean, I just realised Jonathan asked if I ever see Martin Hawes anymore. Uh, we basically yeah. only, we WhatsApp these days because he lives, he lives somewhere else and he works for Monster. He's like one of the real, he's a really important dude at Monster Energy these days. So he's getting on really well. He's got a son who's fantastic at trials, rides motorcycle trials all the time. He's all good. Sorry, I thought didn't really That's ask right. the question. <laughs> well, yeah, some good questions coming in. So the phase 83, what do you think? Um, well, the guy who designed it actually brought the bike before it was made by Orange. He brought his prototype version of it to Margan Park for me to test. Uh, this was probably well before COVID actually. Um, and actually the seat on the bike that they've been using ever since then is my seat. So that guy needs to give me my seat back. <laughs> <laughs> now his name, his name is Des and he's, um, he's a genius engineer, guy's clever. When you talk to, you know, when you're talking to someone, you're like, your brain's working differently to mine. I can't keep up with you. He's like one of those super smart dudes. Um, and yeah, it's a fantastic looking bike. The girl who's riding it, her, her name slips my mind, but she was a really good EWS rider, actually, but she had an injury um, and is now, the, is now the sort of like rider for that bike. And she looks wicked fast on it. Um, so I'd be, definitely be interested to ride it. I've seen it up close and it's a, you know, engineering, um, a, a piece of engineering art. It's really clever, but um, I've not had a go yet. Maybe I, maybe I can persuade them and let me have a go on a video or something like that. Yeah. I don't know. Well, it's the cool. next one is from my mate Che, and I, I hesitate to even ask you this, mate. What's next in your in your daft ideas book? Uh, and it says, "P.S. You're a legend." Oh, thanks very much. Um, I don't I don't know if I really have daft ideas to be honest. I don't. I I think. I yeah, mean, no. honestly, don't. I'm not. Don't. I don't mean like. Um, I think if you're doing a video or something, or a, you're trying, you're thinking of something to do, you'd have to be mad to do something you thought you couldn't do. You'd have to be an idiot. Yeah. I've only ever like tried stuff. I was pretty confident. I had down. You know, like I'd definitely do that. Uh, but I'd probably go and practice quite a lot before I could do it. So I was confident. And then, you know, just go for it once you really know you can do it. So I, I don't, I don't buy into the daft idea thing. I'm okay. sort of like, well, it, and I'm not doing it if it's a daft idea. I'll do it if I'm really confident I can do it. I, I think, I think Joe's probably really fed up that he asked that question there. But, um, <laughs> the next what one a is... stupid question! Who is that guy? <laughs> yeah, Jay. Jesus. Um, no, my name is Joseph. How much do I have to donate to ride the random tandem with you? <laughs> now, now there's a daft idea. There's a daft idea. Um, well, I mean, if 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 I if I could get a donation for uh, for Wings for Life, uh, I'm sure I could arrange a ride on the random tandem, no problem. <laughs> but I, I, you donate whatever you feel. Wings for Life are incredible, and if any of you do donate, I'd be most grateful because. Well, they really are amazing charity. Maybe maybe now the time uh, to mm. what are Wings for Life trying to achieve? Martin? Well, Wings for Life it's actually a charity that was started by Red Bull. Um, again, I'm not sponsored by Red Bull. This hasn't got really got anything to do with Red Bull, but they basically Red Bull cover all of the running costs for Wings for Life forever. So it's a charity that if you donate money to it, every single penny 
goes towards what they're saying they're trying to do. They have no running costs, thanks to Red Bull. So, and they use Red Bull offices all around the world. Um, that's where they're based. Um, but it's not a plug for the energy drink. It's a, you know, it's just supported by them because the owner of Red Bull uh, is directly impacted by spinal cord injury. So their, their um, mission is to cure spinal cord injury. It's as simple as that. That's the tagline under Wings for Life, finding a cure for spinal cord injury, which is remarkable. But the reason I, I love them so much um, is because when I was in hospital and I didn't know what I was gonna do, I was searching all over the internet for like I said, I was looking at wheelchair rugby and all sorts of things. And I came across the Wings for Life website and it was so positive. It had so much energy and it was so determined just from that opening statement of finding a cure for spinal cord injury. It made me just, it just lifted me. And there was also a lot of information on there about spinal cord injury that I read literally while I was in hospital and learned about spinal cord injury that not even the doctors were telling me because they've, they've got a kind of, filter how much they're telling you because they're trying to get you to rehabilitate so they've got a very focused job on and hand they don't want to start telling you about too much about what's going to be in the future they're trying to get you to learn to sit up let's do that tomorrow right let's get that done tick right next thing you know can you make yourself a bacon sandwich no joke they try and get you to make a bacon sandwich and i'm like what how is this relevant I've got spinal cord injury, surely someone's going to make me a bacon sandwich. Why do I have to do it? I'm sure I've got the excuse now to never have to make a bacon sandwich again. I could spill hot fat over me at any moment. <laughs> but they do make you do that. I just thought that was pointless. And <coughs> drive a car and all that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, Wings for Life was just a source of inspiration. Not that I was really that focused on the cure. I'm not, I'm not under any illusions that I'm going to be cured. I don't, I'm not, it's not for that reason. Um, that's <laughs> highly unlikely. Um, but I just think it's a very positive message and it's just so ballsy. It's just so determined. Like we're going to, we're going to cure it. Someone in five years, 10 years, someone's going to have the same accident I had. And maybe at the moment where they can really do something, they'll just fix it and it will be normal. It'll be like a normal thing, and that's amazing. I hope they can do that. Well, let's hope everyone's putting around in their pockets. And, um, yeah, come on, you've got a spare pound somewhere. Come on. Come on. <laughs> I've got a nice, nice little one. This is a quick question from Elspeth and Simon, friends of mine. Do you miss the squawk of Magura rim brakes? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's trials right there, yeah. <laughs> no, no, I don't. <laughs> um, hang on a minute, there's more here. Uh, has Martin seen Flip, the brakeless trials guy? Oh, yeah. On YouTube. Great. What do you think of the new generation of riders like this guy? Oh, great question. Um, well, it's so good. Yeah, I mean, that kid is wild because he's riding brakeless and it's just that's bonkers. So good. I mean, there's some really incredible riders right now. And, and the UK in trials, trials is a really niche little sport. It's, it's strange. The bikes are weird. But the riders we have in the UK are phenomenal. Like Jack Carvey has just won the world championship again. Um, his kind of local riding spot, Shipley again up in Yorkshire, and he's he's just a weapon, an absolute weapon. He beat he beats everybody. He's nearly untouchable at the moment. I think that's maybe his tenth world title or something. I don't know how many titles he's won, but we've got some incredible riders in the UK, and we've got some really great riders with some great style too. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's mad to see what they can do. The, the sport has moved on so much since I did it that, you know, it's very, it's, it's very hard to entertain that I was even doing the same stuff, to be honest, but they're, they're incredible riders now. And there's, there's no sort of new techniques that make some things possible now that just weren't on the radar back then. But yeah, there's some, there's some brilliant riders. I love it. I love seeing all the videos coming out and, you know, I wish I was, doing it I can still kind of feel how to do it in my brain you know I, I, I know exactly what when I'm watching someone ride I can 
I know it's all still in my head. And I, uh, yeah, sometimes it's very frustrating to just go, oh man, it's so, it's such a tiny, you know, but for a, but for a centimeter, you know, that's all it is. You know, it's just a, me- just a point where a message doesn't get through from here to my body to make something happen. And it's hard to, it, it, it sounds so simple. It's, it just sounds so annoying. <laughs> so annoying, it's such a tiny little space. Like, oh, if I could just get that, you know, that thing to heal. But it's, you know, but it's all in your head. So you kind of can watch people doing it going, oh man, that must, you can imagine how they're feeling when they're doing it. Yeah, yeah. Although well, I, I, that might be me just pretending that I'd be able to do something that Jack Carvey can do, which I can guarantee I could not. <laughs> so <laughs> that's just lying. Well, it must be fun being involved in, um global mountain bike network at the moment oh it's a blast it's really it's good. brilliant i yeah. love it yeah i love it we've got a, such a we've got such a cool team um i mean obviously it's part of a group called um play sports network um which was founded by a really good friend of mine called simon ware who who used to work at future publishing and then he went off and started his own so he was behind in the uk and all that kind of stuff and then he went off and started this amazing business and I've been really lucky enough to sort of be on the sidelines watching him grow this incredible, like, it's like a monster of a business now. It's owned by Discovery and Eurosport. And we're, we, we're just sort of like the off-road gang are kind of like the, the lunatics of the organisation. <laughs> so there's the roadie guys who are all actually really cool, actually. They're, we've got a brilliant team of friends on the roadie side. So that's the Global Cycling Network. Um, and then the off-road guys, which is Global Mountain Bike Network, Global Mountain Bike Network, um, the tech channel, and we've got um, EMBN, which is uh, for those kooky guys who ride e-bikes. I, I mean, I don't, I don't follow that stuff. Um, <laughs> I get in trouble for that, all right? Yeah, it's wicked. There's, they're just a cool gang of people. and We all have a good time. We basically just get to make up silly ideas for videos and go and make them. It's pretty fun. <laughs> it's a blast. Yeah, it's incredible. And uh, it's, it's going to be a bit of an open-ended question, but where do you reckon mountain biking is going now in, in competitive sense? Is, you're a bit of a fan of enduro, aren't you, Martin? I love EWS. I think it's fantastic. I think it's an amazing way for, it's an amazing participation sport. It's, I think it's sort of like the equi- equivalent of like marathon running. You know, you can have like such a mega entry. You know, I, I was watching AWS in Whistler once. And that's kind of where it clicked in my head. I understood it was like, there was like 600 people riding in this race. I thought, oh, that's amazing. All those people, they're riding against Sam Hill and martin mays and you know they're riding the same event that's brilliant and you can't do that in in uh elite cross country and elite downhill because the level is beyond understanding really you know unless you're one of those people it's nearly impossible to contemplate what they're doing or even entertain the idea of doing it yourself at the how they're doing it so I love any EWS for that, but I don't think you can deny that the downhill and the cross country racing these days is spectacular to watch. I mean, it's just, oh, yeah, it's crazy good, you know? So, I mean, I think EWS has got, a, a, has got to evolve in that sense. Well, EWS could evolve in that sense, but I'm not sure it needs to become that. I think it's its own thing. You know, and I think because people can do it and it relates to the bikes we all ride, that makes it very important. You know, I, I think that makes it, a, a, you know, an incredibly important part of the sport. And it's in- incredible the number of enduro riders that have moved over to downhill, isn't it? And how skillful they are. Well, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, I guess maybe, I don't know, maybe a decade ago, you would never have imagined. A, 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 an enduro rider could win the world cup downhill or world, world championship downhill but that's nearly happened a couple of times so that's yeah i mean the the uh the level is you know very similar they uh, but you know you, i don't know if anyone's ever going to really 
do both. It's very hard. I think it's a hard season to be able to do both those things. I think Martin Mays probably did about as close as that to, as you can. And if Sam Hill, of course, I mean, he, he's not had a great season this year, but he was um, definitely someone who could have nearly won EWS and World Champs downhill in the same year. So it's pretty impressive. And I've got another question from the audience. Uh, question from Pete. On the com competition front, with the insane level of trials now, I think speed trials need to be bring, brought back. <laughs> oh man, yeah, I loved speed trials. It was great okay. fun. Yeah, yeah. Me and <laughs> yeah, me and yeah. Horsey, me and Horsey invented speed trials because we thought, oh, what what we want to see is some racing over trials obstacles. But uh, it, it never really it never really took off. It was a bit of a niche thing. But we tried tried to invent this new style of trials riding. I don't know why we thought that was a good idea, but um, it was definitely fun to do. It was difficult, really difficult. The moment you try and go quick at trials, it, it starts getting a little bit, um, a little bit sketchy. <laughs> but yeah, um, who was that who asked that? Pete, he's showing his age asking that question. He really is. Yeah, must, be, <laughs> must be an old kid, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and possibly the last question, unless another one comes up on there. Um, this sport is great, isn't it? it it's just mm. the spirit of this sport is something else, isn't it? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great community of people. I was at Bike Park Wales at the, uh, um, what day was it? I went to Bike Park Wales. What day are we now? Monday. So for, for, uh, Thursday last week, I went to Bike Park Wales and was just hanging out doing a video. And the great thing about going to a place where there's loads of riders, whether it's like your local trails or, I always just think you're almost best mates with everyone straight away. You just know them. They could have different political views. They could have all sorts of, it's just a great leveler. You're just there on your mountain bike and none of the other stuff really matters because, oh, cool, you've got six Santa Cruz. Oh, nice to meet you. You know, it's like whatever, you know, it's just like you suddenly got this connection with these people that's just effortless. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to know what kind of personality they are. You just instantly already know them a bit. And I love that. I think that's a great... I think that's a great um, part of mountain biking. It's probably true of lots of sports, but you know, I'm sure in climbing it's a very similar thing. But I don't know, mountain biking's, you know, it's very. It's good just sport. mountain biking, Martin. It's the best sport. Yeah, all those all those roadies wave to each other though, don't they? I've Is seen they? that. Yeah, I've seen them doing it. I've seen them doing it. And you know what? My my wife said something really funny about um, road riders the other day. We were leaving this um hotel and we're going down sort of like some country roads and we got stuck behind big long line of traffic following like a peloton of sunday super slow actually sunday road riders they were incredibly slow they were like trying to go slow three abreast and i and i was like i oh, don't i don't mind i don't you know i've definitely done it myself and um it's fine but my wife said she got getting really annoyed and she said imagine if that was a group of bmx's I was like, oh, that's interesting, isn't it? That's, that would be a different uh, response, wouldn't it? If you pulled up behind a gang, it wouldn't be a peloton anymore. It would be a gang of BMXs, three abreast on a country road in their like big wide handlebars. Imagine all the horn beeping and the effing and blinding. It's funny, isn't it? <laughs> it is good, Martin. Martin, it's been an absolute pleasure. I've enjoyed it, thanks. Um, and uh, I just hope you continue to have as much fun as you're having out there with the rest of the community and with GMBM. And yeah, uh, absolutely. once again, everybody, stick your hands in your pockets, give some money to Wings of Life. Thanks, Thanks very much. Nice. Thanks, everyone. Good night, everyone.